Oyster Bay, Long Island, 1939. Amateur historian Morton Pennypacker uncovers a chest of old documents in a musty attic. Inside it lies an unexpected answer to one of the greatest mysteries of the Revolutionary War. The identity of the American spy codenamed Samuel Culper, Jr. After the war, Samuel Culper returned to his home in Oyster Bay and became a recluse and died without having, ever having told a soul about his involvement in the Culper spy ring. The letters which Penny Packer discovers finally shed light on the true identity of one of George Washington's most trusted spies, without whom the war could not have been won. April 19, 1775. British troops launch a surprise attack on the militias of Lexington and Concord, hoping to crush the fledgling American rebellion. Patriot spies Paul Revere, William Dawes, and Samuel Prescott learn of the plan and ride through the countryside sounding the alarm that an invasion is imminent. Forewarned, Patriots amass to repulse the attack in what becomes the first battle of the Revolutionary War and the first successful use of American espionage. Spies were important during the American Revolution because of the lack of communication without them. They were really the eyes and ears of the officers. Otherwise, they had very sparse and inaccurate information. The man chosen to lead American troops through this dangerous, shifting landscape is a Virginia plantation owner named George Washington, appointed commander-in-chief of the new Continental Army on June 15, 1775. Washington places great importance on espionage, as witnessed by one of his first official expenditures, the payment of $333.33 to enlist a spy in Boston. George Washington was a hunter, especially a fox hunter, and I think there's a bit of an analogy there. He liked to pursue and track down uh, the quarry, but he also liked to stay out of sight and manipulate and mastermind very dangerous games. The war does not begin well for the new commander-in-chief. After suffering a resounding defeat at the Battle of Long Island, General Washington's army dejectedly retreats back to New York City. Concerned with his enemy's next move, Washington asks for a volunteer to infiltrate enemy lines. For this spy mission, Washington chooses a well-seasoned veteran of the French and Indian War, Lieutenant James Sprague. Sprague flatly refuses the assignment. I am willing to go and fight them, but as far as going among them and being taken and hung up like a dog, I will not do it. Spying was not considered an honorable profession. No matter whether you were spying for the right side, so to speak, or not. Spies were executed by hanging. They were not even entitled to a soldier's death, which was death by firing squad. And so they were facing not just death, they were facing a humiliating death. Despite the stigma attached to espionage, a young lieutenant named Nathan Hale bravely volunteers for the dangerous duty, emboldened by the stirring words of his friend, Major Benjamin Talmadge. When I consider our country holding open her arms and demanding assistance from all who can assist her in her sore distress, I think the more extensive service would be my choice. Hale, a 21-year-old former school teacher, couldn't be more ill-suited for the assignment. His problem was that he had relatives who were on the British side, and also he had been seen riding with other American officers as they abandoned New York. And no one knew how to train spies that early in the Revolution. So they sent him in with no cover identity, no code name. They didn't tell him you never carry any incriminating papers. Captain William Hall attempts to talk Hale out of the mission, pointing out that he is too frank and open for deceit and disguise. In his journal, Captain Hall records the prediction, should he undertake the enterprise, his short, bright career would close with an ignominious death. But of course, uh, 
Nathan wanted to be part of what was going on. He, he was a very ardent patriot and he wanted to do something. And he joined the army and he volunteered to be a spy. Hale chooses to travel disguised as an itinerant school teacher. Having taught for many years, he knows that it is an occupation that should put him above suspicion. With little more than some books and his Yale diploma, the young spy journeys to Norwalk, Connecticut and slips behind enemy lines on September 15, 1776. His mission? Record British troop strengths and uncover what their next plan of attack will be. That mission will never be accomplished. Seven days later, a British officer visits the American camp to discuss a prisoner exchange and casually mentions that a spy named Hale had been hanged that morning. When he was captured, he was very f straightforward with the information. Oh yes, I'm a spy and I'm a patriot and that's the way it is and you don't want spies who are that outgoing. Nathan Hale is summarily sentenced to death and handed over for execution to the ruthless British Provost Marshal, William Cunningham. Cunningham refuses Hale's last request for the comfort of a Bible, but does allow him to write farewell letters to his commander and family. The next morning, after Hale is hanged, the British officer tears the letters up. Nathan Hale was put into an unmarked grave, and nobody knows where he is. Nathan Hale quickly becomes one of the most powerful icons of the American cause the brave martyr who goes to his gallant death with the words, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. But did Hale actually say those famous words? As far as we can tell, he said that, although there were longer and windier versions, in 1799, Hannah Adams wrote the first history of New England, and she gave a much longer version. Others said that it was, uh, tis a pity uh, that I have but one life to give. Most experts now agree that the well-educated teacher was probably quoting from the play Cato by Joseph Addison, which reads, What pity is it that we can die but once to serve our country? No matter which words he uttered, Nathan Hale's death gives a new sense of urgency to American spy operations. The Continental Congress formally establishes three committees whose duties are to secretly procure arms, correspond with foreign agents, and root out British spy plots. The membership of these spy organizations, predecessors to the modern CIA, is a veritable who's who of the founding fathers. John Jay, for example, the first Chief Justice of the United States, was the leading spy catcher in New York. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was meeting in a church, which he didn't often go to, with French spies to try to get some help from France very early along. Thomas Jefferson was on secret committees both in Virginia and in Congress. It's interesting to me that they were always trying to make peace and plotting at the same time. They'd be writing the Declaration of Independence, but at the very next time they'd be organizing spy rings and sending out spy catchers. Outnumbered and outgunned on the field of battle, General George Washington employs every trick in the book to protect and maintain his meager army. He had to preserve an army intact. One of his main jobs was to stay out of a, of a big battle in the open field because against British regulars, these untrained militia would have just folded, as indeed they did on many occasions. So that his job was to, was to really know what the enemy was doing so that he could not only give battle but avoid battle. Washington discovers that misdirection can be a powerful weapon in protecting his army. The man who could not tell a lie proves to be a master of deception. He took a great deal of pleasure in confounding the enemy. And that was very important to him, to do as much as he could to get the straight information on his side and to do as much as he can to make the information that he was giving either wrong or sort of a mixed message so they wouldn't know which way to go with it. The first opportunity for Washington to use misinformation arises in the dark hours of December 1776. 
Having lost nearly 4,000 men in the desperate attempt to hold New York, Washington and his dispirited troops abandon the city to the British and retreat across the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. Washington's troops safely make the dangerous crossing. While a formidable force made up of British regulars and German Hessian mercenaries amass on the opposite side near Trenton, New Jersey. Washington knows his situation is dire. If the British press their advantage and attack his decimated troops, the Americans will be annihilated. Nathan Hale's friend, Dragoon Major Benjamin Talmadge writes, This was a period of great dismay. The enemy had been victorious and all was confusion and dismay, and it seemed as if we were on the eve of despair and ruin. Patriot scouts report that the enemy troops appear to be content with taking up comfortable winter quarters in the town of Trenton, leaving the Americans to camp out in the brutal cold without shelter. But General Washington knows better than to trust appearances. He needs to know what the British plan to do next. He needs a spy. John Honeyman answers the call. John Honeyman is my favorite Revolutionary War spy. He had been a bodyguard with General Wolfe uh, in the French and Indian Wars in Quebec, so lots of British officers knew what he looked like and assumed he was on their side. So he was able to walk right into Trenton, find out exactly how poorly prepared the Hessians were, where all the guns were, all the supplies, all the barracks, then just wander out in the country, get himself captured by the Americans, and give all the information back to Washington. John Honeyman's adventure does not end there. Once briefed on the condition of the British and Hessian troops, Washington orders Honeyman to escape back to the enemy line with some special information, some disinformation. John Honeyman was the key to the first American victory at Trenton because while he was in there spying on the British, he was telling them that the Americans weren't prepared at all. They couldn't possibly attack. And so even when Colonel Rawl, the Hessian commander, got information from his own spies that the Americans were attacking, he said, fiddlesticks, these clodhoppers wouldn't dare attack, and completely ignored his own officers. Thanks to the work of John Honeyman, General George Washington successfully ferries 2,400 haggard American soldiers across the ice-choked Delaware River and descends upon the unprepared enemy camp. Rushing to rally his troops, Hessian Colonel Johann Rahl is cut down by Patriot marksmen. Ironically, when the attackers search his body, they find a note containing advanced warning of the attack. There was a tendency on the part of many generals to believe information if they got it themselves. If you could convince them that a person who was on the side of uh, the British, a Tory, was giving out information that he had discovered or found somewhere. Um, and it fit in what, what their ideas were about what was going on anyway, then they'd believe it. And that's what Washington did. Military historians consider Washington's counterattack at Trenton to be one of the most audacious maneuvers ever attempted. Like Lazarus rising from the dead, the moribund American troops are invigorated by the victory. The turnaround is eagerly recorded by Major Benjamin Talmadge. This event gave a new force to our affairs, and where gloom and dismay prevailed, zeal and courage began to appear. Thus, the campaign of 1776 closed with honor to the American arms, although a considerable portion of it had been replete with disaster. Despite the spectacular success of individual spies like John Honeyman, General Washington realizes that he cannot rely solely on them. What he needs is a permanent solution, a pipeline of information from the British camp to his own. By 1778, 
New York City has become the command center for all British military operations. Realizing the importance of infiltrating this stronghold, George Washington envisions a permanent spy ring to funnel information from Manhattan. Any word he could get of what was going on in New York was good for him to know. To make his dream of a New York spy ring a reality, the commander-in-chief turns to his young dragoon major, Benjamin Talmadge. We don't know exactly why Benjamin Talmadge decided to uh, be head of the spy ring, but we do know that, of course, he was very, very good friends with Nathan Hale and was very disturbed at the fact that Nathan Hale was hung. Talmadge, who adopts the code name John Bolton, chooses the relative safety of his native Setauket, Long Island, as the base of operations for his spy ring. Setauket gives him easy access to Manhattan, as well as a diverse pool from which to recruit secret agents. Major Benjamin Talmadge chose people around him um, to be part of the spy ring who were just ordinary farmers, shopkeepers, whatever wouldn't raise suspicion. Talmadge enlists the services of Lieutenant Caleb Brewster, who runs a mercenary fleet of whaleboats on Long Island Sound. Brewster ferries secret messages between Washington's camp in Connecticut and a man in Setauket known only as Samuel Culper. A local woman named Anna Smith Strong coordinates Brewster's comings and goings through secret signals hung on her laundry line. They would hang out a black petticoat saying that the whale boat was in. In other words, the boat that was going to carry the information across Long Island Sound had arrived. And then they would hang out beside it handkerchiefs, which would indicate which of the coves and inlets in Setauket Harbor, which ones would be used to take the uh, information across to Connecticut. The messages are shuttled to and from New York City in the supply cart of tavern owner Austin Rowe or the saddlebags of Samuel Culper himself. Later, when Samuel Culper, who was kind of a nervous man, he got the impression that things were too dangerous for him to be in New York. For him to be in New York when he was really a farmer on Long Island was stretching credibility a bit. So he discovered another man who could serve as a gatherer of information in New York City. And so he changed his name to Samuel Culper Sr. and the new man became Samuel Culper Jr. Culper Jr.'s identity is one of the best kept secrets of the American Revolution. He is rumored to be a well-placed loyalist businessman, but the only people who know the truth are Samuel Culper Sr. and Benjamin Talmadge. As far as we can tell in the writings of Washington and the letters and correspondence that went back and forth, he never did know the identity of Samuel Culper Jr. That was kept secret even to Washington. The Culper gang uses numerous tricks to disguise their correspondence, including a newly created invisible ink. It was a very sophisticated one, much more so than what had been used previously. A message would be written on a sheet of paper, and it would essentially vanish into the paper. And unless you had the reagent, unless you had the second part of the stain to brush on, you couldn't reveal the message. To make their correspondences even more secure, Talmadge devises a simple replacement code with numbers representing names and other common words. They're very simple in comparison to today's uh, complicated code messages, especially with a computer, but they were sufficient for what was going on during the Revolutionary War. The effort quickly pays off as coded letters from the Culper spies begin arriving regularly in General Washington's camp. The Commander-in-Chief finally has the information pipeline he longed for. Some of the material that they gathered seems very mundane to us. Just tracking day to day the operations of the British Navy and the British Army, supplies, what they had, what they didn't. But all of that was crucial for Washington. He had to know where the British troops were and then possibly where they would go next. They also uncovered the efforts on the part of the British to flood the uh, New York market with counterfeit money, which was crucial information. I think the Setauket spies 
did a lot of day-to-day -day work for which they don't get credit. I think that their information gathering was vital. Despite all of their precautions, spying proves dangerous for the culprits. The messengers are often accosted and interrogated, as experienced one day by the jittery Samuel Culper Sr. I this day just saved my life. I was attacked by four armed men. They searched every pocket and lining of my clothes, shoes, and also my saddle, which the enclosed was in. But thank kind providence, they did not find it. Don't mention this, for I keep it a secret for fear it should intimidate all concerned here. Such incidents do intimidate the culper spies, often forcing them to lay low for weeks at a time. Their longest sabbatical comes in 1780, just when their services are needed most. A secret flotilla of French reinforcements for the Americans is sailing towards Newport, Rhode Island. General Washington desperately needs confirmation that the British Navy is ignorant of their imminent arrival. At Washington's frantic urging, Austin Rowe makes a special trip to New York City. The intrepid messenger rides the 56 miles through no man's land, then waits while Culper Jr. swiftly collects and records his intelligence. Rowe immediately rushes back with the message, reaching Setauka in time to get the report across the Sound that evening. So this turned out to be one of the quickest uh, transfers of information and communication that had occurred by the spy ring during the war. Rowe arrives just in the nick of time. Culper's intelligence shows that a double agent in the American camp named Gustavus has warned the British, and they are sending their entire fleet to ambush the French ships. The British were going to go out and try to either chase them off or else try to capture them as they were landing. It was a vulnerable spot for the French. With the British troops already on the move and too few soldiers to stop them, Washington attempts a bold and audacious ruse. He quickly draws up a detailed but fake set of battle plans and places them in the hands of a double agent. And what it said was that Washington was preparing with 12,000 troops to attack New York. And of course, this wasn't true, but it scared the British enough. And so at the last minute, as the British fleet was sailing up Long Island Sound, frantically, beacons were lit all across the Long Island shoreline, summoning the British fleet back and it worked perfectly. And it was really probably the greatest coup of the entire war for the Culper spy ring. Washington successfully uses the same ploy throughout the war, effectively keeping the bulk of the British Army trapped in New York City for the duration. While George Washington enjoys great success with espionage, the British are also engaged in the same art. On numerous occasions, seemingly patriotic Americans turn out to be deadly double agents. Sergeant Thomas Hickey leads the list of murderous conspirators bent on killing General Washington. We don't know how many attempts there were in his life. Um, they all failed, obviously. But Thomas Hickey was particularly disconcerting because he was one of the bodyguards of George Washington. Tradition holds that Sergeant Hickey attempts to kill Washington by poisoning his favorite food, peas. Fortunately, the general's housekeeper discovers the plot and intercepts the deadly dish before it can be served. But Hickey's deeds will soon be forgotten, eclipsed by a man whose name has become synonymous with treason, Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was Washington's best shock trooper. Uh, he was his best field commander. And whenever the army was doing badly, Washington would send in Arnold. Even as he leads stunning victories on the field of battle, Benedict Arnold's private life spirals out of control. He receives word that his wife has died, his personal businesses fail, and the Continental Congress refuses to grant him a promised promotion. The last straw comes when his leg is shattered during the Battle of Saratoga, and Arnold is transferred to a desk job in 
Philadelphia. He realized that this war was going to ruin him financially. And he was determined at this point to use his position as military commandant in Philadelphia to line his own pocket. So he embarked during those early weeks in Philadelphia on a number of very, very shady schemes. The shady money-making schemes bring Arnold nothing but grief. He loses his initial investment and finds himself criticized in the newspapers for his involvement. When Arnold wasn't fighting, he got into fights. He got into trouble. He couldn't take criticism. Congress, Pennsylvania radical politicians, and finally Washington criticized him openly in the press, and it was too much for his pride. Disenchanted with his treatment, Benedict Arnold decides to sell his services to the British Army, but not without first rationalizing his choice. Arnold could never admit that he was anything other than the image he had created for himself during the war, which was that of a patriot and hero. So he had to convince himself that he had done what he was doing for patriotic reasons, and he couched it in the terms that he was saving his country from the grip of Catholic France. And he went through this whole elaborate justification. General Arnold first proposes the idea of defecting in an anonymous letter to British spymaster John Andre on May 10, 1779. The choice of Andre as a go-between is an interesting one, considering his past connection to Arnold's new young wife, Tory sympathizer Peggy Shippen. When John Andre first came to Philadelphia from England, even before the war began, he fell in love with her, and they formed a lifelong attachment. When she died, she was wearing a locket of, with his hair in it around her neck. So I think when, when it came time for Arnold to offer his services to the British, I, can, I, I can't imagine that she didn't say to him, here's who you should write to in New York. The letter proves to be just the first volley in a torturous year-long negotiation over money. Constantly trying to prove his value to the British, Arnold sends Andre a series of coded letters filled with pilfered American military secrets and signed with his code name, Gustavus. The British didn't know till the very end that it was Benedict Arnold, but it had to be a high-placed officer because he was giving them vital information. He warned them, for example, of a French attack uh, at Rhode Island. It was Arnold himself who had sent warnings to the British about French reinforcements landing at Newport, Rhode Island, the same information which prompted the Culper Gang's desperate mission. Still the British cannot resolve how best to employ their high-ranking spy. One reason they didn't decide what exactly they wanted him to do in the long run was because they wouldn't tell him how much they were going to pay him for it. They kept saying things like, you know, get the command of a major corps, turn it over to us, and you will be rewarded beyond your wildest expectations. Well, this wasn't nearly good enough for Benedict Arnold. He wanted them to be very specific. Arnold finally hits on the idea that will reap the financial reward he craves. He persuades Washington to put him in command of West Point, one prize he knows the British will not be able to resist. George Washington called West Point the key to America. It was part of a 15-mile chain of forts that stretched from West Point down the Hudson. As long as those forts held, Washington could maneuver his troops and keep the British in Canada from joining the British in New York. Upon assuming control of West Point, Arnold begins deliberately weakening the defenses of the fort. For his plan to be successful, he must ensure that a British attack on the installation will result in total annihilation of the American defenders. He knew a lot of these guys at West Point, and he seemed not to be disturbed at all by the fact that they were either going to be killed or taken prisoner. And he was ready to betray them without turning a hair, which profoundly affected me. A face-to-face -face meeting is arranged between the two spies to finalize details. Arnold insists that Andre rendezvous with him in the no-man's land near West Point. 
Andre's commander, Sir Henry Clinton, approves the dangerous plan, but expressly orders his brash young officer to abide by three rules. Not to go behind enemy lines, not to put on civilian clothes, to stay in uniform, and most of all, not ever to carry any incriminating papers. As long as Andre follows Clinton's orders, he will be safe. Because if something goes awry and the Major is caught, he will be treated as an important British prisoner of war, not a loathsome spy. As an additional precaution, General Arnold sends orders to his subordinates informing them that a friend named John Anderson has permission to pass through the area. Unfortunately for Arnold, one of his underlings is American spy master, Benjamin Talmadge. One of his female spies had mentioned that Major Andre picked up a letter addressed to John Anderson. So he was beginning to put two and two together that this John Anderson was somebody he wanted to talk to. John Andre, posing as John Anderson, meets Benedict Arnold on the banks of the Hudson River on September 22, 1780. All goes according to plan, until overzealous patriots suddenly open fire on Andre's ship, the Vulture. Major John Andre watches in astonishment as the Vulture sails away, abandoning him on hostile shores. Arnold went back to his headquarters at West Point and just left Andre there. So Andre was stranded. He couldn't get back out to his ship the next night. In desperation, Andre disobeys his superior's orders. He dresses in a disguise and sets off on horseback towards British lines. In his pocket, the Major carries a pass signed by Benedict Arnold, identifying him as John Anderson. In his boot are stuffed the secret plans to West Point. Now this was incredibly stupid and Benedict Arnold was not a stupid man. Andre could easily have memorized what was on those pieces of paper. He didn't have to carry anything. But I think it happened because Arnold had been disappointed before and he wanted a paper trail. So that if this didn't work out, he could point to these papers by the, uh, to the British and rub it under their noses and say, see, I did everything I possibly could, now pay me. He wanted there to be evidence of his efforts. So he put Andre in harm's way. Andre nearly makes it back to safety, but one mile from British territory, three AWOL patriots accost him and discover the plan secreted in his boot. Dragged before Lieutenant Colonel John Jameson, the local American commander, Andre's fate seems sealed. But Jameson totally bungles the situation. He ships the recovered West Point plans to General Washington but sends the prisoner back to Benedict Arnold, his co-conspirator. Of course, Andre would have been safe if he'd gotten to Arnold because they could have made their escape together. They had to escape at this point because Washington would have figured it out once he got the plans. But Andre's luck doesn't last. Just before sunset, a cavalry patrol arrives at Jameson's camp, headed by Major Benjamin Talmadge of the Culver Spies. Well, I would love to have heard Talmadge's language when he said to Jameson, you idiot, get him back. His commanding officer, um, who had let John Anderson go, said, no, there's no reason to bring him back. But Benjamin Talmadge insisted. Now, that's a very unusual thing for a um, subordinate officer to do, to say, no, I want this man back, and I'll do it at my own responsibility. In other words, if we're stopping the wrong man, I'm the guy that's going to pay for it. So his commander let him do it. A courier overtakes Andre near Peekskill and orders his return. In the confusion, though, a letter from Jameson is still delivered to West Point, describing all that has taken place. Forewarned, Benedict Arnold makes his escape on Andre's ship, the Vulture, which has returned. When he heard that Benedict Arnold had gone over, George Washington sat down hard, put his head in his hands, and said, who can we trust now? He then sent out Hamilton to try to kill uh, Arnold, 
that plot failed. It was one of Washington's few failures. But he hated him so much that he was willing to bend his own laws and orders to try to have him assassinated. With his traitorous plan exposed, General Benedict Arnold safely escapes to the British headquarters in New York City. His co-conspirators are not as fortunate. Left behind to fend for themselves are Major John Andre and Arnold's wife, Peggy Shippen. Nobody had any idea that she was part of any of this. They were falling all over themselves, trying to say, oh, you poor darling, you've been left alone by that absolute wretch. And oh, this poor innocent young thing. Nobody really believed she was involved at this point. And in fact, they didn't find out until 1930. An American military tribunal finds Major John Andre guilty of spying and sentences him to be hanged. Leading him to the gallows is Culper spymaster Benjamin Talmadge. So Talmadge, the classmate of Nathan Hale, marched John Andre to his death and personally supervised it. You can call that reprisal, I think. For his part in the conspiracy, Benedict Arnold earns the rank of general in the American Legion, a British unit comprised entirely of Patriot deserters. He leads several bloody campaigns for the British in the waning years of the war before escaping to England in December 1781. He dies heavily in debt 20 years later. Once he committed treason, almost anything that went wrong was blamed on Benedict Arnold by both the Americans and the British because neither one of them liked him. He was not going to get his security, which is what he'd done it for. He was not going to get his reward, either monetary or socially. Uh, everybody hated him. Well, nobody loves a failed traitor. Congress officially proclaims the end of hostilities on April 19, 1783, exactly eight years after the battles of Lexington and Concord. Samuel Culper, Sr. of the Setauket Spies, files his last official report three months later, an account of expenses incurred in obtaining secret intelligence. Soon after being elected president, George Washington embarks on a tour of his new country. Included is a stop to meet the people of Long Island. I believe that he was also doing this to thank the spies, at least the spies in Setauket, for their service during the war. Because one of the places that he stopped was the Rowe Tavern in Setauket. And of course, Austin Rowe had been the courier during the Revolutionary War. President Washington never reveals the names of the Culper spies, and it is years before rumors of their involvement surface. One of the most elusive proves to be Samuel Culper, Jr., who is not positively identified until his private papers are discovered in an Oyster Bay attic in the 1930s. Everyone knew that Samuel Culper, Sr. was actually Abraham Woodhull, uh, just an ordinary farmer. But nobody knew who Samuel Culper, Jr. was. Morton Pennypacker was able to put together a chest full of writings that had come from Raynham Hall and definitely match it up with the handwriting of a man named um, Robert Townsend. Townsend was a prominent Tory businessman and well-known reporter for the inflammatory British newspaper, Rivington's New York Gazetteer. Ironically, one of the most vocal critics of the American cause turns out also to be one of its greatest spies. It was a closely guarded secret his entire life. He lived out his life alone uh, in, in uh, Oyster Bay, living there in the family home with his sister, who never married, the two of them gradually fading away, becoming ghosts in their own home. So that's the tragedy of the Culper spying, as well as the glory that they achieved. The 1930s also bring another revelation, the first hard evidence of Peggy Shippen's involvement in the defection of her husband, Benedict Arnold. 
It has been known by American historians since the 1930s that she was involved in the treason. But by looking at records in London and loyalist claims petitions, uh, it's possible to find that she was the highest paid spy on either side in the revolution. So we're still learning, and there's, I think, a great deal more to be learned.